Welcome to the 2019 Online Rules Presentation. My name is Charlie Winsky, Assistant Commissioner of the South Carolina High School League. I'm going to spend time going through the first part of the presentation with you, and then I'm going to turn it over to your Sport Commissioner to take care of the NFHS rules. The first part of this presentation will deal with South Carolina High School League rules and regulations that are pertinent information for you as a head coach. Some of the information we're going to go through is going to be old information for you, while some of it's going to be brand new information. The old information that we're going through are either requirements that you must follow as coaches or rules that we're seeing broke, broken consistently in the last few years. Please share this information with any of your assistant coaches or anyone that assists with your program to make sure that your program stays in compliance with the league rules and regulations. Coaching requirements. All coaches every year must go through the NFHS courses, the concussion course, heat acclimatization course, sudden cardiac arrest course. New for the 2019-20 school year is protecting students from abuse course. All four of those courses can be found at nfhslearn.com. Every coach in your program from volunteer to paid must go through that course each year prior to coaching in a practice or contest. As a reminder, all coaches must be CPR and AED certified. This must be done every two years. Your certification for both CPR and AED is a two-year certification. So please check with your athletic director or your certification cards to see if you're due for a new certification for this school year. Sportsmanship. League office, we continue to see issues with sportsmanship by players and by coaches. We want to take some time this year in our rules presentation to put some questions to you coaches to get you to think about some things as it pertains to your team and your behavior for sportsmanship. One of the first things we want you to think about is how often do you discuss this with your team? Do you make sportsmanship a priority? Do you take time each day to go through with your athletes, your expectations, how you want them to handle adverse situations? Or do you put it on the back burner and let it become a reaction when it happens? If you put it on the back burner and let it become a reaction when it happens, you know there's a high chance that the result is not going to be what you expect. Understand too, we're working with teenage athletes. No matter how much you go over something and how clearly you set your expectations, you're still going to run into a situation where a kid's going to make a poor decision. What we don't want is one kid's poor decision to lead into multiple kids' poor decisions and have a, multiple kids ejected from a contest due to one incident. We continue to see an increase in team displays of poor, poor sportsmanship throughout the year. One kid making a mistake is one thing. Multiple kids making the same bad decision at the same time escalates the situation tremendously. Take time, discuss this with your team, set your expectations, let them know what will and will not be tolerated. Two other questions we want you to think about is, if your team doesn't win, and obviously everybody wants to be a winner, and everybody wants to win every time you step foot on the competition field or court, but if you're not to win, or if you are to win, how do you want people to remember your teams? When the game's over, during the season, when you leave the sporting event, years to come, how do you want people to remember your teams? Obviously, everybody wants them to remember their teams as playing hard, consistently playing hard, giving it their all, all the coach speak you can throw out. But what is it about their character you want people to remember? No matter how difficult the situation was, they held their heads high and handled it well. Or do you want people to remember that whenever something went wrong or whenever there was a chance, they showed poor displays of character and poor displays of sportsmanship? You set the tone. You're the leader. You lead them in drills. You lead them in team activities. You lead them through contests. You also lead them down the correct path of sportsmanship. Take time to, to speak to your team about sportsmanship daily. Make this part of what you do. Make this part of your culture and your expectations. And remember, sports, they don't build character, they reveal it. 
What character will you and or your players reveal when times get tough? What character will you reveal when things are going your way? It's all part of the educational-based athletics process. Teaching skills, winning, developing the athlete, developing the person. Sportsmanship falls under the ladder, developing the person. This is something they can carry with them as they go through life. Make it a priority each day to set your expectations on sportsmanship. Okay, athlete ejections. If you have an athlete ejected, remember, they can remain in the bench area during the contest. This becomes a supervision issue. If, if you ever have an official or someone that tells you your athlete has been ejected, they must leave the facility, they must leave the venue, that is not correct. Athletes are allowed to stay in the bench area if they've been ejected. They cannot return to play, but they can stay in the bench area provided they do not become a hindrance in the remainder of the contest. Also remember, any athlete ejected from a contest becomes immediately ineligible. They will remain ineligible to compete until they've been cleared by the league office. And cleared means serving their suspension. Failure to do so will result in you playing an ineligible athlete. Some changes this year to length of suspensions. Football, swim, lacrosse, and cheer will remain at one, as it has been for many years. Golf, volleyball, and wrestling, because they use play dates and not number of contests, will remain at two. New this year is a three-game suspension. This is the minimum. We've increased the number of games allowed in these sports. Therefore, we feel like the percentage needs to go up. The executive committee changed this this past May. The sports of basketball, baseball, softball, tennis, and soccer. An ejected athlete will carry a minimum three-game suspension during the regular season. These minimums, the one, two, and three games for the sports, are during the regular season. If you look down at the bottom, playoffs have been changed to where an ejection in the playoffs carries a minimum next game suspension. So your minimums of one game, two games, and three games in the respective sports are for the regular season. Should you get ejected in the playoffs, all sports fall under a minimum next game. Understand these games are set at the minimum. If you are ejected and it is a severe ejection, you're not going to get the minimum. If your ejection is a minor ejection or a routine ejection, chances are it's going to be set the minimum. I can tell you coaches to share with your athletes, disrespectfully addressing a game official is not going to get you the minimum. Disrespectfully addressing a game official is going to exceed the minimum. So if you're in the sport of basketball, baseball, softball, tennis, or soccer, and you disrespect a game official, you're going to get more than three games. In golf, volleyball, and wrestling, you're going to get more than two dates. In football, swim, lacrosse, and cheer, you're going to get more than one because those are the minimum. Reminder, the ejections are served at the level the ejection occurs. If you're ejected from a sub-varsity contest, you must set the, the number of games you're suspended for at the sub-varsity level. And a second ejection in the same sport will equal a two-week suspension. Remember, that can carry a huge punishment, especially if you've got a basketball team that over two weeks has got seven games scheduled. You're going to miss seven contests because that's the minimum is two weeks for your second ejection in basketball. Okay, ejection of coaches. Unlike players, coaches, if you get ejected, you must leave the facility or the stadium immediately and you cannot return. A number of issues in the last few years where coaches have been ejected and they weren't quite sure they had to leave the facility or stadium. We want to make it clear, if you're ejected, you must leave the facility or stadium immediately and not return. No questions asked. Whether you agree with the ejection or you disagree with the ejection, if you're ejected, leave. 
the best thing you can do as a coach when you've been ejected is to stop arguing, stop questioning it, accept it, and move on. In many cases, the minimums for coach ejections and the fine and the suspension are increased once the coach becomes ejected. You can do yourself a huge favor by leaving at that point in time. Remember, as a coach, too, you cannot return to coach at any level until cleared by the league. If you're in a tournament, first game's on a Friday at 8 o'clock at night, and you get ejected, you don't get to go back out there Saturday and just start coaching because you haven't heard from the league office. If you haven't heard from us, that means you haven't been cleared. If you're, and we will not be communicating this with you. We'll be communicating with your AD or principal. So if they've not heard from us, then you're not cleared. And you assume that they haven't heard that you keep sitting out. Changes this year to coach ejections. Executive committee approved in April. The coach ejection will now carry a minimum two-game suspension, and the fine will remain at $300. In the past, the minimum ejection for coaches has been one-game suspension and $300 fine. The minimum game suspension for coaches is increased to two, and the fine will remain at $300. And remember, that fine goes to the school. The school decides they want to make you pay them for it. That's between you and your, your administration at your school. Now, that being a two-game suspension, this is going to be crucial for you because, remember, the suspensions of a coach must be served at the same level where the ejection occurs. If you're a varsity-level head coach or assistant coach and you're ejected from a sub-varsity game, you're going to be fined $300 and you're going to be suspended from the next two sub-varsity games. What that means is you will not be able to coach in any contest until you have served a two-game suspension at the sub-varsity level. For example, you're helping your assistant coach out on a Thursday night, or your JV coach out on a Thursday night. You get ejected from the Thursday night JV contest. Your varsity team plays on Friday. Your varsity team plays Saturday. Your varsity team plays Monday. You won't coach in any of those games. Your JV team plays again on Tuesday. That'll be your first game suspension at the JV level. You will have missed the Friday, the Saturday, and the Monday varsity games. You sit the JV game. Your JV plays again on Thursday. You sit again. And then your varsity team plays on Friday. Now you're eligible to coach because you've served your suspension at the level where it occurs. So you've got a two-game suspension at the level it occurred, but you are ineligible to coach in any other contest between there. So essentially, because you were ejected from a sub-varsity game, and because the way your schedule worked out, you actually missed five contests total. Be mindful of that moving forward. There's no reason why varsity coaches should be ever ejected from a sub-varsity game. There's no reason why you should be ejected from a varsity contest. But if you are going to get ejected, understand the consequences of that ejection. And remember, if you're ejected from the final game of the, suspend, of the season, the penalty is a minimum $500 fine. Okay, some reminders on ejections. The athletes... Actions can get them suspended for up to 365 days. Rules and regulations do not allow any suspension to exceed 365 days. Obviously, 365 days suspension are reserved for severe actions of athlete or athletes or coaches. Rules and regulations also call for any athlete that is suspended for 365 days will result in the program being put on immediate probation, which will take you out of the playoffs immediately. Any athlete that leaves the bench during an altercation, they're going to get ejected from the contest, and that's going to result in a suspension. If they leave the bench during the altercation and they become involved by putting their hands on someone, even if it's in a goodwill gesture to remove them from 
the activity on the floor. If they put their hands on someone from the other team, grab them around the waist, pull them back, shove, punch, they're going to be ejected for multiple games depending on the level of their involvement. As we spoke about in the previous slide, disrespectfully addressing a game official is going to result in beyond the minimum for suspension. Physical contact with a game official is going to be an ejection in up to 365 days, depending on the severity of that contact. I can tell you more often than not, that is going to err more towards a 365-day suspension. The best thing you can do as a coach for your student athletes is to video every contest start to finish. Wide angle camera lens so everything can be seen. Instruct your camera operators to keep the camera running during any altercation. The important part of that is, yes, the ones that are guilty are going to be viewed. We're going to know who's guilty. But the most important thing is those that are innocent are going to be able to be cleared. We want to clear the ones that were not involved. We want to clear the innocent. It also allows us to see the level to which the athlete or the coach was involved without video to review the severity of the actions. All we have is what is written up. In some cases, what is written up exceeds what the athlete actually did. In some cases, what is written up doesn't meet the actions of what the kid actually did. Video everything so that we can review it and make sure the appropriate suspension is handled down. Remember, sportsmanship's a choice. Your student athletes make it, your assistant coach make it, and you make it every day. Make it a priority to go through this. Make it a part of what you do daily. Okay, medical information. Reminder, the approved health care providers who can return a student athlete to play anytime it involves a concussion, those five, they all must be licensed in South Carolina, an MD, a DO, an AT, a PA, and an MP. Any one of those five can return a student athlete to play during a contest when symptoms or signs of a concussion are thought to be there. In absence of one of those five, student athlete sent off the field for a concussion-like symptom by an official, that student athlete will remain out for the remainder of the game. Other important medical information for you, just as a reminder, last year we went through and implemented the wet bulb globe thermometer. Please be mindful of that as we get started in the 2019 school year. This does not just apply to outdoor early year activities. This also could be an indoor activity for the early part of the season of the school year and also could be involved in the latter part of the school year when the temperatures begin to rise again. All athletes' physicals must be on file with your school, and the date for that physical to be valid is April 1st of 2019. Any physical dated prior to April 1 of 2019 will not be valid this year for your student athletes. Check with your AD to make sure you have an emergency action plan for your facility, and not only for your facility, but for each sports season. In many cases, you may use the same stadium that another sport uses, but you may not have every access point open to get into that stadium for your sport that another sport would. So just check with your AD to make sure you have an emergency action plan. Make sure you're aware of it, and it's always a good idea to keep a copy with you in the event something were to happen and you're the only person there to be able to make a decision on how to get the emergency vehicles in. All right, tournaments. We've had an issue in the last couple of years with tournaments and a definition of what a tournament is. Just a couple of things to remind you of. All tournaments, invitationals, and jamborees, they must be sanctioned by our office. Once we get it sanctioned and approved for sanctioning, we post that on our website. If you're participating in a tournament, an invitational or a jamboree, check our website to make sure that it's been approved as a sanctioned tournament. If you participate in a non-sanctioned event or host a non-sanctioned event, you are subject to penalties and or fines. Don't put yourself in position 
to get a penalty and or fine by participating in a non-sanctioned event. Any contest in the preseason must be in a tournament that is sanctioned. We've had to call a few schools this past school year and remind them that you cannot host a round robin invitational in the preseason. If you're going to host an event during that preseason date period, it must be a tournament. That means it must be a series of contests in competition for a championship at which at least first and second place are decided by a final contest. So if you're going to host an event in the preseason, it must be a tournament, it must be sanctioned, and when you submit your application for sanctioning, you must submit your brackets as they are to be played so that we can approve that as an approved tournament. If you have any questions on that, please feel free to call our office and we'll be glad to help guide you through the process to make sure you get it right. Okay, transfers are ineligible players. The responsibility of making sure that every athlete on your court or field is eligible falls on your principal and athletic director. But it's always a good idea for you to remember what a transfer is and what an ineligible player is so that you can get the information to your AD and not place someone in error. A good thing to do is the first day of tryouts or the first day of practice is to check with every person trying out for your team and just ask one simple question. Who was not at our school from the first day to the last day last year and who was not at our feeder middle school from the first day until the last day of the previous year. Anyone who was not at your school day one through the final school day of the year before or at your feeder middle day one through the last school day the year before is considered a transfer. What that means if they came in day two, enrolled in your school, and stayed till the end of the year, they are still by rule a transfer. If they came in the last week of school, they are a transfer. Do not ask them who was at our school last year. That could potentially put you in a position to place someone who is ineligible due to the transfer rule. Make sure you take time to ask that question. Pass that along to your AD as soon as possible. If you know you have an athlete who's participating in preseason workouts months ahead of your season, who was not at your school the entire year last year or not at your feeder middle school the entire school year before, make your AD aware so that they can start the process of a transfer. And in the event they're ineligible due to the transfer rule, they still have time to look into any options that may exist for eligibility. If you wait till the last minute, you could put that athlete in potential of having to sit out an extended period of time waiting on eligibility. And remember, to be eligible, that transfer must meet one of the criteria for eligible transfers stated in our handbook. Just because someone's a transfer does not make them ineligible. If they meet one of the criteria that makes them an eligible transfer, then they will be eligible. That is up to your AD and principal to determine whether that eligibility exists. And reminders, if they're not eligible for any reason, they cannot participate in a scrimmage, jamboree, or contest. They can practice, but they cannot participate in a scrimmage, jamboree, or contest. Okay, the 75% rule. With the change of the sports season opportunity to practice outside of your sports season with your school team. We've seen an increase in questions from coaches and schools as it pertains to the 75% rule. We've also seen some violations where coaches didn't truly understand the 75% rule. They had a thought of what they perceive it to be. 
I'm going to take a moment to go through the basics of the 75% rule. Reminder, the 75% rule only applies to when a coach from your school is associated with the outside team. This includes all school employees and volunteer coaches. So if they work at your school or they coach at your school, paid or unpaid, assistant or head, if they're coaching an outside team, that has your players on it, your student athlete, the 75% rule will apply to that outside team. If you or one of your coaches or one of your employees coaches an outside team with players made up of other schools, from other schools or from other states, 75% rule doesn't apply to you. 75% rule applies to outside teams with returning players who dress for a varsity contest the previous season. If you're coaching an outside team that has players from your school on it, but not one of those players dressed for a varsity contest the previous year, then the 75% rule does not apply to you. It only applies to when you're coaching an outside team or when a coach from your school or an employee from your school is coaching an outside team that contains returning players who dressed for a varsity contest the previous season. The numbers that you're allowed to have on that team are listed in the rules and regulations. It's not 75% of your outside team roster. The numbers you're allowed to have of players who dressed for a varsity contest the previous season on your outside team is in the rules and regulations. So we'll continue with the 75% rule. Here are some examples. Example one, soccer is allowed eight players on an outside team under the 75% rule. So if you go to the rules and regulations, and you look at the number of players allowed per sport on an outside team coached by a coach from your school, a volunteer coach from your school, an assistant coach from your school, or a school employee in the sport of soccer, that outside team is allowed to have eight players on that team who dress for a varsity game during the previous season. So if you're coaching a soccer team as an outside team, and you have seven returning players on that team who dress for a varsity game at your school and 11 players who are on the JV season and never dress for a varsity game, that outside team will meet the 75% rule because you did not exceed eight players on that outside team that dressed for your varsity team the previous year. Example two. Basketball has allowed three players on an outside team under the 75% rule. The outside team coached by a coach from your school or an employee from your school has four players on it who dressed for a varsity game the previous year and seven players who never dressed for a varsity game. This would be a violation. The reason that's a violation is that basketball has only allowed three players on the outside team that dressed for a varsity contest the previous year. The outside team in this example had four players who dressed for an outside, who dressed for the varsity game the previous year and were on the outside team. Therefore, it would be a violation. As always, if you have any questions as to the legality of your varsity team, your outside team, call our office prior to establishing your outside team. Okay, our final slide before we'll turn it over to your sport commissioner for the rule changes in the FHS rule book is on open and closed season. And a lot of questions on this this past year and seeing a lot of um, coaches who don't fully understand what they can and cannot do during this time. Remember, if it's an open season, during that open season, you have 20 days of practice. That 20 days is for your use however you want to use it, however many hours you want to go, however many kids you want to have out there, the only requirement is you 
must make it open to all students and it cannot be mandatory for any. If you want to have 200 kids come to your softball practice, great. You only have 20 days with it. During the open season, your school facilities can be used. I have a lot of coaches who aren't sure they can actually use their school facilities during the open season. The open season, 20 days of practice. You to use how you want. School facilities may be used. Open to all students and cannot be mandatory. And a reminder that football and lacrosse, you have pad exemptions during that 20 days that you can actually use pads and days where you cannot use pads. Make sure you pay attention to your sport specific rule if you're in football or lacrosse as it pertains to pads. The closed season. During closed period, a coach cannot work with any athletes. It's on campus or off campus. The only exception to this would be if you're on coaching an outside team that has no affiliation with your school. Students are not allowed to use school facilities on their own. Example of this, no open gyms. You can't unlock the gym and say, hey, I can't be in there, but you can go shoot. That's a violation of the closed season. Strength and conditioning activities are allowed. We get a lot of calls. Hey, can we lift weights? Can we run? Can we condition? Absolutely. You can lift weights and run and condition year-round. You just cannot teach sport-specific skills or training during a closed period. Reminder, June and July, they're open for practice. The only exception to that is the dead week around July 4th. And also in June and July, you have 10 dates for team competition in all sports. That wraps up the first part of the, your rules presentation. I want to wish you all best of luck this year. And if always, if, as always, if you have any questions on anything we've covered here or any questions that, on anything that was not covered here, do not hesitate to call our office or have your athletic director call our office. Our number is 803-798-0120. Thank you. Welcome to the 2019-20 Wrestling Rules online presentation. My name is Charlie Winsky. I oversee wrestling here at the South Carolina High School League. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to give our office a call at 803-798-0120. Get new to the South Carolina High School League rules and regulations for the 19-20 school year. Student athletes will be allowed a two pound growth allowance. Again, that date now has changed to December 26th. That date used to be, I believe, January 1st, but that date is now gonna be December 26th. Just as a reminder, this allowance cannot allow you to establish your minimum weight class. As always, schools are allowed 16 varsity and 12 sub varsity dates. Schools are going to have the opportunity now to enter girls into three dates that will not count against the original 16. In the past, what happened is if you, you took a team to an event, you could to a tournament, for example, you could enter 14 individuals into that tournament. If you entered 15, you had to count as two dates, so you had to pick your 14 and go. This didn't promote female rest, females wrestling at the varsity level, didn't promote them to um, get into tournaments because you didn't want to sacrifice an opportunity for one of your starters or one of your wrestlers who was uh, potentially better than that female in that weight class from getting an opportunity to participate in that tournament. Now, you have the opportunity to enter girls into three of your dates that will not count against you as dates. The only catch is, is those matches must be female versus female matches. And those matches must be a part of the original event tournament you're into. Okay, what that means is you can't have a female wrestle against a male and say, hey, we're counting that as one of our female events. It's, it's got to be an all-female event or all-female match for it not to count. And you can do that up to three times um, during your season and it will not count against your 16 dates. Anything over three will count against your 16 dates. 
it must also be a part of the same tournament slash event that your team has entered into. So you can't send your varsity team of 14 males to Lexington for an individual tournament on a Friday and Saturday and send six females to Rock Hill for a tournament on the same Saturday and Sunday. That's two separate tournaments. That's two separate events, and that will count as two separate dates for your varsity team. However, you can send 14 males to Lexington, and as a part of the Lexington tournament, you send four females to participate in a female event at that tournament. You can do that up to three times, and it will not count against your dates. The idea here is to promote more females in wrestling and to help grow female wrestling in South Carolina. Okay, now we're going to move to your National Federation rule changes for 1920. Uniform rule 411A, a female contestants wearing a one-piece singlet shall also wear a form-fitting compression suitable undergarment that completely covers their breast. Um, this is just clarifying that suitable undergarment that provides maximum coverage shall be worn under a one-piece singlet. See the language here underlined in 411A that suitable undergarment completely covers the buttocks and groin area shall be worn under a one-piece singlet. Any other undergarment worn under the one-piece singlet which extends beyond the inseam shall be tight-fitting and shall not extend below the knee. Notice the language struck in 411A. The rule will now read the one-piece singlet may be worn with full-length tights with stirrups one-piece singlet shall be school issued and in the note underneath that rule female contestants wearing a one-piece singlet shall wear form-fitting compression suitable undergarment that completely is covering their breast under 411b legal uniform consists of it's talking about the compression shorts or shorts designed for wrestling shall and it goes on Talks about snaps, buttons, or pockets. I obviously, you cannot have those. A suitable undergarment which completely covers the buttocks and groin area shall be worn under shorts designed for wrestling and compression shorts. Shorts designed for wrestling may be worn over the singlet. And here we are under the uniform rule again. Um, and this again is just clarifying that female wrestlers shall wear that undergarment that completely covers their breast and that all wrestlers wear suitable undergarments that completely cover parts of their body. My logos on earmarks, I mean, sorry, on ear guards. Manufacturer's logo or trademark or any reference that appears on wrestling ear guards, including legal hair cover, can be no more than two and a quarter square inches with no dimension more than two and a quarter square inches and may appear no more than once on the ear guards. It's just clarifying what actually can be on those ear guards. Okay, hair rule, 421. The term well-groomed is extremely subjective, and there's no standard to meet such an arbitrary expectation. Hair that is manipulated poses no threat to either wrestler. It is neither abrasive nor cumbersome. Physical hair treatments, controlled items, do present, do present a risk to either wrestler due to the hardness, texture, or abrasiveness and should not be allowed. In play pick A and B, both of these uh, play picks, the hair is legal in the state they're in on these play picks. Here's an example of hair that is longer 
than what the rule allows. However, you see that in play pick A with the ponytail and the female. However, a legal hair control device, such as a rubber band, shall be secured as not to come out readily during wrestling. So you see in play pick A, she's got the hair up and essentially a bond with the rubber band. Well, obviously braids, bobby pins, anything that's abrasive is not going to be allowed to use to hold the, the hair up. A head cover, hair cover, as you've been able to use in the past, or rubber bands or rubber band-like items that are not abrasive are going to be able to be used to hold the hair up to meet the hair length rule. Play pick here you have is of a female, but obviously now not uncommon to see males wearing long shoulder length hair or even further that need to get their hair up and use the appropriate either head cover or rubber bands to keep it up. And here's a play pick of a male. You see in play pick A that hair is legal. And in B they've got a legal uh, control device. And in this case it would be a rubber band that secured the hair so that it doesn't come out readily during wrestling. Here's a couple other examples of what legal hair would look like now under the hair rule. Both A and B are legal. And A, the length of the hair has obviously been put up in a control device such as a rubber band. Again, securing it so as not to come out readily during wrestling. The hair in play pick B is legal. Just a reminder of the, of the rule as it reads, during competition, all wrestlers shall be clean shaven with sideburns trimmed no longer, no lower than the earlobe level. Hair, they've struck the words trimmed and well groomed and the hair in its natural state. Uh, that, it'll read now, hair shall not extend below the top of the ordinary shirt collar in the back and on the sides. The hair shall not extend below the earlobe level in the front. The hair shall not extend below the eyebrows. Any special equipment, just a reminder of what a wrestler shall not wear during a match. Wrestlers shall not wear arm sleeves or leg sleeves do not contain a pad. There is no purpose or function of these arms or leg sleeves if they do not contain a pad for protection. Therefore, they're not allowed during a match. Please make sure your wrestlers are not coming to matches with a pull-up arm sleeve or pull-up leg sleeve that do not contain a pad. It's one of those things, if you don't allow it in practice, it won't get to the game, it won't get to the competition mat. Okay, weigh-ins, four, one, four, five, seven. This is just clarifying what items a female wrestler shall wear at weigh-ins. Language specifies a female wrestler wears items that completely cover their buttocks and breasts. All right, in some rules that actually involve wrestling and the action here. Takedown, rule 525.2, clarifying the definition of a takedown here. Uh, this rule change is eliminating confusion. Last year, um, a reminder the rule here is not the college rule, and that if the hands touch the mat, you immediately score a takedown. And the college rule reads if you hands immediately touch the mat, you immediately score a takedown. To be consistent, we say that whenever the hands touch the mat, they're considered supporting points. The removal of majority of the wrestler's weight criteria from this rule is eliminating the need for the official to make a judgment call on weight-bearing extremities. In addition, the application of our new rule on supporting points becomes consistent throughout the rule book. So this rule now says takedown shall be awarded when one or both knees of defensive wrestler are touching the mat beyond reaction time or when the defensive wrestler's legs or torso are controlled and the wrestler's hands touch the mat beyond reaction time. All right, 527-1A, technical violation. If the defensive wrestler intentionally goes out of the wrestling area to avoid an imminent scoring situation, it's a technical violation.
and a defensive wrestler intentionally goes out of the wrestling area to avoid an imminent scoring situation and is a technical violation. Technical violation under 731. The change that was required due to the previous change. Going out of the wrestling area, forcing an opponent out of the wrestling area. During an imminent scoring situation is considered technical violation of fleeing the mat. Both wrestlers need to make every effort to remain in bounds. When the official feels that either wrestler has failed to make every effort stay in bounds during an imminent scoring situation, the offending wrestler shall be penalized for fleeing the mat. Stalling under 766D, in addition to shoelaces becoming undone, need to be added. And penalties and warnings under 813. Penalties and warnings are cumulative throughout the match. Each infraction has a specific penalty. Penalty for illegal hold, maneuver, technical violation, except the false start or incorrect starting position. Unnecessary roughness in a wrestler's unsportsmanlike conduct in the match is awarding the opponent of the offender one match point on the first and second offenses and two match points on the third offense. Under 813, the fourth offense shall result in disqualification. See the language that's been struck there. The first two calls for a false start or incorrect starting position will receive cautions. Following the two cautions, one match point will be awarded to the opponent of the defender for each subsequent violation. Here, warnings and penalties for stalling. There's a new penalty chart and a new stalling penalty chart. As you can read, warnings and penalties for stalling are now cumulative throughout the match and are penalized independent of the progressive penalty chart. On the first offense, the wrestler will receive a warning. The opponent of the offender will be awarded one match point on the second and third offenses, two match points and choice of position on the next restart for the fourth offense, and a fifth offense will result in disqualification. So stalling now um, will have this progressive or this penalty um, independent of the progressive penalty chart. Okay, modifying the rule to extend and evaluate head, neck, and cervical column injuries. When an athlete suffers a suspected injury during the head, neck, or cervical column and or the nervous system, an appropriate health care professional is present. The referee shall give the signal for the timer to indicate evaluation time may be extended to a maximum of five minutes. The key here is that an appropriate health care professional is present. If that is the case and you've got a suspected injury involving the head, neck, cervical column, or the, ner the nervous system, then the referee shall give the signal to indicate evaluation time may be extended to a maximum of five minutes. This is allowing that medical professional uh, appropriate time to assess the athlete. Again, under injury time, you see letter B there. The following modifications to injury timeouts will be used in all competition regarding injuries to the head and neck involving the cervical column and nervous system. We talked about the last one, additional five minutes with the appropriate health care professional. In absence of the appropriate health care professional, all injuries to the head and neck involving the cervical column and or nervous system will be covered by the same time frame as other injuries. And again, just as a reminder, when appropriate health care professionals are present, they have jurisdiction to extend the allowed time limit to a maximum of five minutes for evaluation of the injuries to the head, neck, cervical column, and or the nervous system. And this gives them extra time to evaluate that student athlete. If there were to be a second occurrence in injury to the head, neck, involving the cervical column and or nervous system in the same match, shall require the wrestler to default the match.
when the provision for adding those five minutes is used, the time consumed for the injury will in no way affect time used or available for other types of injuries. So it'll be separate to other injuries and time needed to other type to address other types of injuries. Okay, team scoring under 922F in a dual meet, both teams are tied following the conclusion of the match, a tie-breaking system that goes into place to determine a winner. Criteria A and E, A through E are going to remain the same, and F now becomes the team giving up the least number of forfeits. The criteria from F all the way to Q will be relabeled appropriately, but the team giving up the least number of forfeits will be moved up to F. 2019-20 editorial changes. Editorial change, it's a language change in the book required due to a rule change this year dealing with head, neck, and cervical column injuries. Remember if that contestant is injured and there is an on-site appropriate health care professional, they determine additional time is needed. They can be given up to an additional five minutes. And again, that five minutes is not deducted from their previous injury time allowance. My points of emphasis for this year from the National Federation. This is a reminder that the head coach, you have the obligation to ensure that each wrestler is properly equipped and they're wearing the proper uniform. You also have the obligation to make sure that all wrestlers are compliant in terms of their skin, nails, and their hair meets suitable links, and if not, they have this suitable um, head cover and or um, rubber bands to put the hair up to meet the rule. A reminder regarding the uniform and wrestler's appearance. Obviously, modesty challenges across the country are not having a positive impact on the sport. Just make sure both genders are wearing suitable undergarments that completely covers their buttocks and groin area. This would especially be true on those that are wearing a white singlet that could possibly get wet through sweat or through um, contact with an opponent and create some modesty issues for a student athlete. You need to make sure they're wearing an appropriate suitable undergarment to allow that white not to become a see-through material. Reminder on stalling. Forcing an opponent off the mat or fleeing the mat to avoid wrestling are considered stalling and must be penalized. Again, stalling. Trying to make sure we're becoming consistent with it. We don't need to be teaching forms of stalling. A reminder that pull, backing off the mat out of bounds Pushing or pulling the opponent out of bounds, hands locked around the leg of an opponent without intent of taking him or her down, or preventing the opponent from scoring is considered stalling. Our officials need to continue to be firm and need to be consistent in enforcing the letter and the spirit of the rule. Coaches, you need to understand this could change from individual official to official. But you need to make sure your student athletes are able to adapt to those changes as they go throughout their season. Again, these techniques should not be taught. Aggressive wrestling is what we want. We want them continued action throughout the match, all three periods if necessary. Just a reminder, injury time rule 821. Wrestlers allowed two injury timeouts that do not exceed a minute and 30 seconds in each match. Sporting behavior, or you can call it unsporting behavior, it's a reminder. The high school league's expectations, the National Federation's expectations, and your expectations should be that your athletes carry themselves in a sportsmanlike manner. All contestants are expected to exhibit proper sporting behavior before, during, and especially after matches. This is whether they're engaging with referees or their opponents. Our officials need to continue to 
penalize improper behavior. Coaches, you need to make sure you take time to lay out your expectations and what your student athletes are and are not to do. Just a reminder, hydration. Remember, proper hydration prevents a wrestler from being weighed in at a lower than normal weight and will thus certified to wrestle at a potentially unsafe weight. So we want to make sure we're keeping our athletes hydrated and not trying to cut, cut weight through not being hydrated. Okay, official signal number 28. See here an additional signal, tapping the front of the head with a balled up fist of either hand. This is indicating that five minute of the head, neck, cervical column evaluation time is about to begin. And this has to go in with the new rule change. Again, balled up fist, tapping the forehead of the official with either hand and certifying that five minutes evaluation time for that head, neck, or cervical column evaluation is going to begin. Reminder, this does not account against the injury time that's already allotted. I want to thank you all. Wish you the best of luck for your 2019-20 wrestling season. Please make sure you take time to go to the South Carolina High School League website. Click on your sport of wrestling. Go to the rules and regulations and make sure you read through pages 51 through 53 so that you clearly understand the rules and regulations governing your sport from our from our office. Make sure you have all your documentation with you at weigh-ins. This is your Alpha Master and your competition data weigh-in sheet. If you see any issues throughout the year, address those issues with the other coach, address them with our office as early as possible so that we can get on top of it. Please do not wait until January 31st to make us aware of an athlete who potentially is wrestling in the wrong weight class and has been doing so for a while. Give us an opportunity to address it, give the athlete an opportunity to continue to compete throughout the rest of the year. If you have any questions, feel free to call our office. It's 803-798-0120. Thank you and good luck.